it's a time of synthesis. It's a time for us to begin to see where where all things stem from a single place and dis different disciplines, you know, from the left brain, the right brain, brain, from music to architecture and the arts and, and science, those where those things intersect. Um, and I think we're kind of coming to the end of the age of the specialist and moving more perhaps into the age of the polymath, the, you know, people that have studied many things and absorbed, and it's not even a study, but I just have a knack for understanding many things that are in, interconnected because you understand them through wisdom while, rather than having to learn them as knowledge to sort of have this knowing that there's a reason for the phase that we're currently in and that we have to move through this breakthrough this threshold this breakdown of the old systems so that something completely new can be reborn and Richard Rudd, welcome back on Just Tap In, brother. Such a gift to be able to continue our conversation. And I know for a lot of people, they may be starting their day with this conversation or maybe even ending it, or maybe it's even just uh, throughout their day. But I'd love to speak on the importance of rituals and daily practices. I know you open up every single morning with an invocation. If you'd love to tell us a little bit about what that ritual means to you and maybe guide us through uh, an invocation to start with. Yeah, thanks, Emilio. It's lovely to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I think doing things um, early in the morning is, is such a powerful practice. Many of us do that and it's an ancient lineage tra tradition, um, particularly if you can be up you know, before the sun and um, depends where you live. I live in the Northern Hemisphere, so um, it's it's dark in the winter months early and I'm up, you know, for a couple of hours in the dark, often with a candle flame, um, usually sitting outdoors um, under a cover. It's often raining, it's often very cold, so I'm wrapped up and uh, have my little teas, my little Chinese teas that I drink. Um, that are a ritualistic way of communing with, you know, the energy of the day. And I, I always do invocations, um, usually do the same one, but I, which is called the invocation of solace. Um, but I thought here today I might do, share a different one. Um, and one that I've never shared before. And because one of my, um, great joys is writing sacred invocations or blessings. Um, and as a as a poet, I you know I love poetry and I love writing poetry and and these are the two things like poetry and prayer are very close to each other um, and in a way I think they're the furthest that you can take words before they drop into the silence and um, and so a blessing isn't you know I'm also a kind of from an old Celtic lineage myself, where blessings were often used, and they're used by many traditions around the world. And it's a powerful thing to utter a blessing or, a, or to speak out a prayer. Um, blessings are specific um, to different things, and I love um, when a blessing kind of comes through to me. And anyway, I know that we're going to be talking a little bit here today about... Um, work and money and business and finance and all that kind of stuff. And this was a blessing that I wrote um, called Blessing of the Good Work. And I, and I wrote it for my own business and my teams and anyone actually for doing anything in the world. But it is a, it's a blessing of, um, of, of work, of the work that we're here to do, the Dharma that we're here to perform and uh, so I thought I'd just share it here. It's the first time I think I've Beautiful. shared it publicly. So mm. and, uh, anyone is welcome to use it. It's an honor. And it's called Blessing of the Good Work. May the light of our soul guide us 
as we approach our daily work in the world. May the soft hues of our differing views merge in a delicate blend of fruitfulness. May our soul's voice be heard and held here in the silent circle of our trust. Together, may we proffer our sacred work as a tonic for the trembling, parched lips of the world. May our work fill us with the joy of creation, and may we never waste a single obstacle, surmounting each alone, yet all together, our heads bowed, our passionate hearts aflame. May the great work of our soul's higher purpose never become a burden to us. May we serve the whole together in impeccable perfection, in impeccable imperfection, weaving the loose strands of our many dreams into the emerald web of the great dreamer. May evening find us blessed and fulfilled our day's work softly laid down. May we enter each night grateful and fully prepared for the mystery of replenishment. May the light of our souls grow brighter each day, drawing us close, a fragrant family of glittering virtues. May our souls be blessed and blessed and blessed again as we come together in mutual reverence to place with care the candles of our hearts around the silent circle of the whole. So it's a nice little blessing to say before you begin your work or if you're working in a business or with teams, it's like a really beautiful way to open up a space and I what stood out to me that was beautiful brother um what stood out to me is the impeccable imperfection <laughs> especially since I made him imperfect <laughs> <laughs> how does one deal or how does one make imperfection impeccable because I have in my in my life's work the gene key of impeccability um so I'm really curious and it really stood out that you said that um because I'm also someone that strives for excellence in what I do and strives for quality. And sometimes that could lead us astray into what's perfect versus what's just good enough for the moment. So yeah, I, I feel like that just rose out of that beautiful poem of, of how do we navigate that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's great not to have anxiety inside oneself around perfection, you know, uh, because we can, you can carry a lot of that anxiety and if you're not, um, there goes my triple flame app, excuse me. <laughs> um, and if you're, you know, if you're not worried about perfection, but if you're striving at the same time for it, I think that's a really good, um, healthy space to inhabit. Um, I think a lot of it also is about um, welcoming um, dissonance. You know, it's something I've been practicing with my teams is that if we feel dissonance whether it's in the field whether it's you know in a, in a relationship somewhere um we we welcome the dissonance right and that's quite a, a challenging thing to do but it's the first stage in a process of transformation when you're working with a group or even on your own or in a relationship is like if you feel dissonance welcome it you know because you know it its imperfection, its unfinishedness is where its magic is. And that unless you welcome it, it it can't begin its journey of transformation because otherwise you're you're holding it off um, or you're distracting yourself away from it or it's making you even more anxious. So I think this word welcome is really, really a key thing in terms of walking that road of impeccability. Because it doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't mean the same thing as perfection. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, the last time we were here and having this conversation, um, 
you walked us through your journey, that cosmic journey that you went through for three days and three nights. And I know there is so much to unpack in that, but the more I, I learned about that experience from you is that on the last day you were taking on a fisherman's boat to Bardsey Island. And this is the island where supposedly Merlin was supposed to be buried. And our mutual friend, Robert Grant, calls you the modern Merlin. And I'm really, really interested because someone that is just coming into your work or knows you can already tell that you're a lover of language and a shaman of, of language in many, in many instances. And that's what a poet is. So what is your connection with Merlin? Why did you feel so drawn to go to that island on that day um, out in the fisherman's boat when you were downloading cosmic consciousness into your psyche? Well, I didn't go there. Con I didn't go there on purpose, <laughs> and um, I was taken there by a, you know, by a, I don't know, by a by a kind of energy, you know, that was really clear, and uh, it was it was really later that I learned about that, um, and many people I know are connect are kind of feel a connection to Merlin, and um, I think there's something about for me, uh, being in the UK, United Kingdom, you know, with the the four magical um, domains of Ireland and Wales and Scotland and England, and how they kind of connect together through the legends of this being called Merlin, who, according to my understanding, is not a single being, <laughs> um, and is a transmission actually is a lineage and so it, it you know those who feel called you know to that lineage are people who often feel a real affinity with music and lyricism and language and the magical use of words and and how it can be used to create um calm and different states of consciousness you know and so um, that's part of my being part of my lineage of of learning, and it's you know I live in these lands, these rainy, cold, dark, damp lands, and I love them. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, and I, you'll often find me tramping the the wet woods um, in the dawn light or at night sometimes, you know, just listening and communing with the spirit of the the wild creatures and the birds and the, you know um yeah so it's a it's a landscape you know the 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 celtic landscape is is very rich and it also it communicates a deep world of soul and its language is is the language of the soul and it's kind of before i even came to do the things that I'm doing now with Gene Keys, I had that language inside me, and I was born with that language, and um, yeah, and 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 I've always loved, um, particularly the English language because it's such a, um, it has such capacity um, to absorb other languages and and really and synthesize. For me, it is the great synthesizing language of the modern times. It's not the only one. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a very useful and can be a very beautiful language. Yeah, so part of my journey. Yeah, and I know you've said that the Gene Keys work really also serves as a mechanism to help people work through any trauma as well. And when we look at trauma, it could be something that happened in this lifetime, but oftentimes it's the lineage of the family that we decided to incarnate into, that our soul chose. And I know you're someone that has done so much work um, to discover about your lineage and you have a very mystical lineage. I know, you know, Dr. Rudd, you mentioned, he was part of this um, circle of Rosicrucians, if I'm not wrong, um, that was working alongside people like John Dee, Francis Bacon. When you were looking into your lineage, what did you discover about yourself in this life and how would you encourage people to really do the work to look at their, not just their past in this lifetime, but throughout their family history? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I experienced um, 
in that mystical journey that I took um, back in the 90s that I had was I had this deep realization that inside the confines of this body, in the DNA of this body, was contained the fractal architecture that of all the memory of of all of of all the beings that I've moved through and that have moved through me or a part of the lineages connected to to this person who's sitting here now so it's a, it's like I'm the tip of a of a river of beings and you know when I dive back into that river and I swim back up the current you know and I have swum all the way to the source um I I kind of feel the ripples sometimes of some of the traumas and I re- and I see all you know the, there's it's all encoded in this lifetime in this body right so it's really interesting and useful sometimes to go back and explore and find patterns um it's not a gift that everyone has um it, it's not necessary or essential but what what's a very useful piece of wisdom to know is that um these trauma lines kind of run through us from the collective and so we're often handling a lot more than is just local to this life or to our childhood you know so and 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 things that are happening to us in our life um are mythic in the sense that some of the um difficulties that we encounter are kind of mirror-like repetitions of earlier fractal occurrences in other existences and so they still ripple and shimmer through us in our lives and so in a way by claiming them fully and by owning our own wounding we're kind of repatterning and recapitulating and you know reclaiming our birthright and it's a transformational alchemical journey for sure it's a magical journey and a very painful journey <laughs> um and at times a very blissful journey but it is the human journey it's definitely the spiritual journey and there's there's no one that goes on a spiritual path that can avoid it and it's you know cuz cuz these thing these energies are coming at us all the time so we're both moving forwards towards our future but actually we're also if we're awakened if we are aware self-aware we're also traveling backwards down that river towards our source and we're pulling back fragments that we've left behind that are unfinished and we're finishing them and one day it said uh, we will come to a life where the part of us that's traveling backwards i'm being very wizardly now i know the part of us that's merlin are you here <laughs> part of us that's traveling backwards towards the source gets very very close towards the source and it's the last few remnants of our karma that we're tidying away and addressing and and it, and the part of us that's that seems to be moving forwards uh is again putting the finishing touches on a cycle of existence that is beautiful you know that so it's almost like as we get to that crowning enlightened moment we also part of us is going right back to the core and the birth of our soul on this human plane and so there's this beautiful fugue between the past and the future that's taking place in us all the time you know swimming backwards in time and and flowing forwards in time in this river and we're that kind of eternal present moment that's in the bottleneck or the hourglass you know the timeless moment that's that's constantly where the transformation occurs you know we're at the core of the torus the toroidal field and and that's what we are we're that humans are if we are the event horizon of of existence itself yeah so and I, another way to look at it as involution and evolution, but that's another whole story. I don't know if I want to go there, but um, it's in my teachings very much. In the Gene Keys, there is still so much that you are still unpacking, even though this transmission came through you, um, which is really interesting. And you mentioned karma. Um, and within the Gene Keys, from my understanding, there 
is a code to understand our karma through the code on rings. Is that something that you're still exploring or um, yeah. coming through with, with more transmissions? It's like, um, you know, uh, spiritual transmissions um, ha have layers to them. And, you know, the, the, the Tibetans call these um, terma, you know, so they're like treasure, they're like, which means treasure. They're like treasures that are sitting in, outside of time and space. And when one of these transmissions kind of opens up inside one, then the first thing you have to do is understand it and live it and embody it. And so there are layers in, in my kind of um, world of the gene keys. Um, a a, one of these, one of these um, transmissions will open up inside me and then I will have to live it and learn from it. And I'm, so I'm its student. And, and often I'm like, I, I, I'm 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 an ignorant student. I have no idea what it does or how it works, and so I have to understand it, unpack it, make sense of it, live it, which is you know going through a transformational process, and then maybe if I'm lucky, I can scribe it and share it in some way um, for others to follow, which is what I've been doing with the Gene Keys teachings. But um, they are they do have layers and. People often say, "Well, what about that one? I want to do. I want to know about the code on rings, which are a specific part of." It. And I'm always saying, "Like, well, I haven't got there yet, so I can't tell you anything about it because um, it's a very deep layer that I may have had some insights into, um, glimpses when the door opens. But I'm also aware of when I'm kind of literally permitted to look at these things and." A lot of the time, I'm. It's like I, I receive instruction, and then I'm really held on a very tight kind of. I was going to say the word leash, <laughs> but I'm held on a very mm -hmm. tight program uh, where I have to be incredibly patient um, in allowing these things to mature and ripen inside my own consciousness before another one can open. So there's a lot of time for integration, and I, and I'm, I'm. I've stopped apologizing now. I used to apologize a lot to my community and my uh, friends, uh, you know, saying for things taking a long time. Things take a long time. So I'll, I'll open something, but then it won't ripen and I won't fully explore it for years sometimes because it's not ready in me and it hasn't ripened. And, and so I don't feel I can share it um, because I don't fully embody it. So I, I have to embody it in some way. I have to it has to kind of ripen inside me and then I'm ready. And so there are layers, big layers left um, for me to do. Code on rings is one of them. And uh, I can feel it coming closer, um, but um, it's still a way away for me. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I'm right now writing a book that is kind of, um, it's my Gene Keys I Ching, you know, and... It's taking a long time. It's it's I I, I don't write quickly. I I'm a contemplative, so I write with deep, in you know, I take my time to really unpack things and understand them so that the words come out in the right way. And um, I'm so I'm I'm a third of the way into this big book um, that's taken me three years so far. Uh, it's probably like another two years, maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> And but this book is a, is is a is a piece that's needed before I get to that next teaching, you know. So in other words, I can't share the next layer because there's a foundation stone piece, you know, that people will need. It's like an, it's like you need the manual in order to understand the actual teaching itself. And so in a way, that's the mystery of of my life. Is I'm I'm I often feel also like I'm the last one to to understand everything. <laughs> Yeah. And and it's so funny because it's a huge reflection as well to the younger generations where, you know, I see that in myself of the impatience of wanting to book as many podcasts as I can and talk to all these amazing people. And I'm like, slow down. Like sometimes I have to catch myself and, and say, really, just slow down and enjoy the process. So, yeah. What are you w witnessing in the young generations? We have access to information at our fingertips. Do you think we're losing some of that patience, contemplativeness 
And if we are, are we gaining something on the other side? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's there's always a, you know, something's taken away, something's given. And in a way, um, what's given is, you know, the, there's a there's a beauty to condensing information, you know. So to condense information into very small time frames or data bytes. A is, meme? <laughs> yeah. In like a meme? Exactly. <laughs> It's a beautiful thing because the being, can, the body can take it in in a much more digestible way. And it's a real art to create that. I mean, I spend my life, um, I've spent my life learning how to condense. You know, I'm, I'm still not very good at it because I keep writing these long books. And, <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, yeah, but it's, it's about quintessence. And so I think that's the gift is distilling things into small spaces, e economy. But of course, the other side of it is um, it doesn't go very deep um, unless you understand the art of contemplation, which is you take you can take a very small sentence, for example, um, or a blessing or something like that, and then perform it over and over and over and over again every day for years. <laughs> and that is what really allows it to unlock or you contemplate it like a Zen koan, you know, those in those Zen schools, traditionally, they're given a, a single line. Um, and then they contemplate that line, literally for months and months and months. And that's all they have to do. They don't, there's a blank wall in front of them, a guy with a stick behind you, <laughs> to make sure you don't fall asleep. And this one line, that's all you have. And it's like, you've got to you just your mind has to keep going round and round and round it, spinning round and until it gives up, and then the magic is revealed. So these really beautiful deep truths only come over time, and uh, they that's why that's the other side of taking things slowly is a very is a very powerful and beautiful thing um, because it also mm -hmm. it also shows us that the journey is more important than the result. <laughs> And the, if the journey isn't enjoy, if you're not pacing yourself, if you're rushing, you're not really able to enjoy the journey. So I guess it's something that everyone learns, or maybe not everyone, but hopefully everyone learns over time, is that when you slow down, um, actually everything else speeds up. <laughs> so mm. the thing that you really desire the most actually starts to come towards you because you slowed down and that's sort of a magical thing i think again a wizardly yeah. truth hmm. and that brought me to this movie uh called the arrival where essentially it's a, this alien ship lands on earth and the humans are trying to get into the ship explore make communication and all of a sudden they're confronted with these like symbols um, and that's how the alien race would communicate is through symbols. And until they cracked the code on what the symbols meant, when they did, they realized that just by understanding the transmission of one symbol, they could be at different moments of time and space, like by location um, and travel through time, just by changing the way that they communicated with language. So I'm really curious because you have such a profound affinity to words, but... I'm really curious as well if there's any symbols that speak to you uh, in specific in your life that you like to, um, you know, give meaning to and, and, yeah. and it, it means something deep to you. Well, words, you know, I use symbols a lot in my teachings. And um, I know that yeah. one of the teachings we were going to talk about today is called the pearl. And the pearl is a great symbol um, for that quintessent, for something that is created out of an irritation but that has great beauty in it. And um, and so so I use these symbols a lot. And another one I use in the Pearl teachings is the, the, uh, the legend of um, like the Holy Grail and, you know, the legend of um, Percival, the, the seeker of the Holy Grail and how he, how his journey in search of the Grail brings him to the, this, these questions about the Grail. And this, you know, and, and he has to answer the, he has to actually find the the question. He doesn't find the answer. He has to find the question. 
and um, he finally finds the question. And you're never really told in the legends what the Grail question really is. I mean, you're sort of given some indications, but you have to find each. Each of us has to find what that is. And in in these pearl teachings, I you know I, I call it the Grail question, and I say the question is how can I be of the greatest service to the whole? That's the Grail question, because that's the the ultimate selfless question. And if we ask that question of ourselves every day, um, it's really powerful because we are we're we're the answer to that question is we have to live it, and in living it we find our destiny, our truth. And in, and unless we are unless we have the space and time to ask that question, we never. It's very difficult for us to fully find a life of purpose because we're we're looking for something somewhere else but we're looking in the wrong place <laughs> yeah when matthias Stefano was channeling um he said that it's not the answer that opens the mind but the question and that really stuck with me and when talking about the pearl i have a, a question for you um which is would you rather be fulfilled and poor or would you rather be unhappy and rich yeah of course that's the that is a, that is a great question and someone wrote to me the other day and said well can't we have both <laughs> <Can I? laughs> i said of course you can it's just a question uh, but it's a it's probing because it does ask it invites you to consider um what is wealth and prosperity and poverty you know and and what is it really as a symbol inside us? Not not what is it outside so much as a as a social uh, reality. Um, but what does it mean inside us? And so, what does it mean to be inwardly prosperous? Um, that's a really good question. What does it mean to be inwardly poor? And um, because the chances are that if we are inwardly wealthy, prosperous, then we'll begin to see it outside as well. Begin to find it outside. Um, doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly be, you know, covered in money, because uh, that may not be our prosperity. You know, our prosperity may be through another lens. And in the pearl teachings, which use the gene keys, you know, their their codings, uh, it's sh- it, you know one of the things you see. And anyone's watching this, by the way, you can go to genekeys.com and you can dial in your profile and you can look at your pearl sequence. It's a it's a little triangle like that. It has f- f- three. Um, spheres and one in the middle and um, and there's a sequence uh, that I discovered that helps each of us unlock prosperity um, but it's and it's natural it's, it's embedded in in every soul like this code that unlocks our prosperity and there are steps in a way they're not really steps I present them as steps because they're really uh, layers of revelation or transformation that we need to move through in order to to kind of for prosperity to be revealed in us through us and so what you see is different shadows that we you have to overcome and they're unique to you your shadow pattern and they're connected to what i said earlier about you know um aspects of our ancestry um that we hold or of our childhood, they could be um, self-esteem issues. They could be um, issues of shame or guilt or betrayal or various things that we hold. And they, what they do is they can they attach to the things in our outer world, like relationships or money, or you know they attach to the way we see things. And then we have to, you know, so our outer life then becomes a mirror of a transformational inner journey. An alchemy and so in our relationship to money for example that's where we we have some really good triggers that come to us that allow us to move through progressive layers of healing and it's not about having money you know having money might be your trigger you know like the very wealthy people for example have just as many triggers as people that don't have the money. So it's not about having or not having it. It's more about flow. It's about how does vitality, which is really what we're talking about, flow through you, through 
your capacity to serve the whole. You know, that's what it comes down to. And um, so it's a very, very, the, it's called the Pearl because it's a very, very simple teaching. Uh, but it, it invites us or challenges us to move through specific shadow sequences. You know, it's called a Pearl sequence um, that, are, that are very unique to us. So mine, for example, um, is, a, is called a line one. Um, that's where my journey through the pearl begins and a line one journey there's six of them you know and, they, and there are 64 keys as well obviously those are the gene keys so you have to kind of look at the language and decipher it for yourself through contemplating it you know it's not just like given to you you have to kind of understand it inside your body inside your emotions inside your relationships inside your your life but then so a line one is is about self-esteem and self-worth and um, because that's the foundation it's line one it's the foundation of uh prosperity or poverty is and is in internally i'm talking about not externally internally you know so self-esteem is what keeps you from flowing you know if you're not if lack of self-esteem keeps energy stagnant inside your system it's not that you know and and it doesn't matter where you know where it came from or what caused it, um, it, it's the same for all of us. We have to kind of go very deep inside our beings to find these wounds and then forgive ourselves and learn to love ourselves through them. And it, again, it doesn't have anything to do so much with money. or that's, that's, that's not the same thing. This is like internal. This is an internal state that I'm talking about. So it's not a kind of get rich quick course or anything like that. It's a it's a digging into the roots of trauma that we hold that often attaches to money. So it's 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 a really profound journey for each of us. I mean it's a journey that's unique to each of us. So I've had to really mm. dig deep into that kind of lack of self-worth and look at well where does that stem from in me and how far back does that go? And that's quite a journey. That's quite a swim. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I heard from you this uh, this Latin phrase that you that you mentioned, um, which was "spiro ergo prospero." And the more I contemplate the pearl, in that sense, it's like it's deeply connected with our our nervous system. And one of the things that we can control with our nervous system, there's so many autonomic processes like digestion, there's, you know, the circulation of our blood. But the only thing that we can control in our nervous system is our breath. So I'd love for you to speak upon how our breath is deeply intertwined with our prosperity. It's deeply intertwined because it's our, it is, the, it is how we align to universal rhythms. And in a way, when we talk about the breath and we think of the air coming in through our nose and our mouth into our lungs, that's just one breath. You know, actually, there are layers of breath. There's a, uh, you were mentioning earlier about my little uh, Triple Flame app, which is a free Jinkies app. And it's called the Triple Flame. It's on the App Store. And on there are various meditations. And there's one called the Three Harmonies. And... Uh, it's really beautiful, actually. But it's it's about twenty minutes long, and it goes into three breaths. The three, and it's important to understand this because the 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 breath that moves through our respiratory system is, in a way, the outermost breath. The next breath in is our heartbeat, is our pulse. So the first thing you do in that meditation is you balance your respiratory breath and your heartbeat. You know your pulse, so they come into balance. So. You start by focusing on your breath coming in, and then you focus on your pulse, which you can do by holding your here, literally. And then you start to, you invite those two. That's all you do. You invite them to find a harmony. And then you'll, so you can be sitting there and then you're breathing, but you're also listening to your pulse. And those two rhythms in you start to come into harmony slowly on their own, just because you invited them to. You, it's not a technique you do. It's a technique you allow. And then there's the third, the third pulse, the third harmony is the cells, the intercellular fluid that is of deep, the deepest pulse. It's the deepest breath in us. 
And it's the, the fluid that moves in and out of all of our cells simultaneously in a pulse. And that pulse is more connected to, because we're 80% water, it's more connected to the tides, to the moon, to the celestial bodies. So you then listen to that pulse, and then you introduce those three harmonies to each other, and they all start to come into alignment in our body. And when that happens, and it can happen in about 20 minutes, actually, if you were doing the meditation, it's really profound. But as it happens, you, you move into stillness, like a, an incredible stillness comes over your being. Like l it just sort of falls on you because, and even your your physical breath becomes very, very subtle because it's been absorbed by these three other breaths. And what happens there is you, you come into this incredible stillness and you come right into the core of your center. And that's where prosperity is. It's in that, it's right in that still silent point at the core of our being. That's where we generate prosperity from. You know? And so, and you know, that's why that's why we do these practices to come into that place so that out of there comes incredible lucidity. Because it's only when we have that stillness in our mind that we can see things clearly and we can make clear decisions. And they, they, they're the right decisions. They're decisions that are in harmony with this being and the timing of all existence. So it's actually literally how we create good fortune. You know, it's, it's how we create luck through the breath. So yeah, we, it's, you're right. It's, um, it's the only way really that we can achieve true prosperity is coming into that deep, deep, central breath point yeah and i'm almost like imagining how you know the forests or nature in general also takes those inhalations and exhalations and we've also said that nature is designed to spend and share and i know you know for many people have this habit of they make money and they just want to keep it you know um, and not not allow it to circulate or share it with other people what you know what you're talking about in the syntropy of business um, how can we learn from nature because we're not separate from it but how can we learn from that reflection of us to be more in tune with that with that harmony and and how that relates to prosperity as well yeah I mean I really love this term syntropy and uh, I've really my my work this, in the last sort of year has really been, um, as, a, as a sort of spiritual teacher, has been working in my business, you know, and applying these principles to a modern day business, which is not something I thought I'd ever do. And I started off by just, you know, I started off by just saying, by getting the, uh, my group of allies and just saying, you take care of this. I'm going to just do my thing on the mountaintop and you just, you do the thing here. <laughs> and, and that I'll just write, you guys are good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and bec through a series of events <laughs> that were out of my control and crises, uh, I was pulled right into the business and my tension had to go there. And I was like, Oh damn, I'm going to have to like do this. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. And, and this is like one of those teachings that I mentioned, like, unless you, like the Pearl, for example, it's, it's, well, it's all very well to read it. It's a book, you know, there's a little book here I've written on the Pearl here, the Pearl Sequence. It's an online program. Um, it, there's a retreat coming up. You know, you can do this teaching, but actually to bring it into everyday life is a whole other thing. So I was, I was challenged by the forces of the divine to say, right, you you want to write this stuff, you put it to practice in a business. I'm like, oh wow, really? I you know, and I and I haven't written much for about a year because I've been like, I mean, I've been engaged in this process of bringing syntropy, which is the opposite of entropy. You know, syntropy is how to it's basically bringing generosity, the spirit of generosity, into a very flawed model that is out there in the world of capitalist you know society with and and you know it's like 
It does not serve us. So how do you bring an awakened transmission into a modern day business? It's a, it's a nightmare, <laughs> you know, with, with legalities and all the complexities and layering and stuff. And unless you really kind of bring that, if you, if you it's a lot of effort, there's a lot of energy to bring it in, to bring the spirit of generosity into everything, to touch everything. You know, so I've literally had to look at like the world of contracts and lawyers and find a lawyer who like would understand this and go, well, how can we like soften these contracts? How can we make them fair? You know, and but still protect, you know, what needs protecting in both that person and us or, you know, both sides, you know, and and so. Um, those kind of those things are like you've really got to tackle some dense areas of consciousness, and you know, I, in a way, we're operating in a in a field that's completely because it's so full of flawed flaws, um, and it's so, you know, it's so it it so doesn't serve the earth, it so doesn't serve balance, it you know it creates more division, it creates steeper gaps of rich and poor and all those things so how do you how do you create a business that's truly centropic that is of that is that serves everyone in it that isn't just a kind of you know one of the questions that's come up strongly is how do you create a spacious business you know where people are relaxed and not working too hard and you know, because I, almost all businesses I've come across that are doing well, people in them are overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, they're working really, really hard. It's highly hyper-stressed. Yeah, and they're um. overwhelmed. And so how do you create, how do you change that? How do you bring transformation and generosity and spaciousness into the workplace and and divinity? You know, not just like saying nice things and, being kind to each other like conflict resolution and but real gutsy stuff edgy stuff you've got to bring it into the you know into the everyday kind of quite harsh world of business and i am finding that an amazing edge in my life and challenge um but bringing the spirit of syntropy into everything is 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 a powerful thing you know you've got to you you have to take care of every corner you know you can't leave and if if you leave a corner untouched it immediately comes and gives you a problem <laughs> so anyway that's what i've been doing and um and really trying to understand inside all that my own um personal wounding as well around you know the part of me that wanted to be separate in the beginning you know i don't want anything to do with this money system it's just it's horrendous you know and actually i realized that we have to bring our love into it and transform it from the inside out that takes courage that takes commitment it takes teams of people working really well together um and you know what a what an amazing edge that is for all of us i think to to sort of create a new model a new paradigm within the existing flawed structure because it all sounds very nice to build a new one right now but it's it's like mm. we have this thing here and it's it, you know we have what we have and there will be a new one in the future that may well i mean i've predicted through the gene keys like it's like it may well op operate more like the ancient gift economies of the distant distant past you know where everyone's serving together but currently um yeah we have a model that um is deeply you know distressing for many many people so it's it's a you know bringing generosity into it bring service into it you know, I think one of the ways that each person can do is ask that question, how can I be of the greatest service to the whole? How can this business or how can this this work I'm doing, how can my whole presence be of the greatest service to the whole? And then out of that question, come all your synchronicities, come your allies, come 
you know, and that's that's the magic in a way of asking that question. And that's what this pearl training and seek seek's not really training. This is pearl sequence is all about. Is it's a science of luck, of good fortune. Um, but it's not a it's something you have to embody, it's something you actually have to kind of do rather than a philosophy. Anyway, I've mm. I'll give you a moment to <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Not at all. And and it's interesting because it's a whole different question from, you know, when we get up in the morning and if we're running a business or if we're working in, in, in a job, we we might ask ourselves, what can I do to enhance the work that I'm doing or enhance that work in the world, whether that's the metric of profit or the metric of followers or the metric of whatever we associate value to. This is more like, how can I soften myself to receive the the next steps from the consciousness of what this what the whole needs right now it's a whole different way of looking at it and i just got that immediate insight as you were explaining that um right now you know we're seeing a rise of this creator economy um especially in the in the younger generations you're part of it i'm part of it in the in the creator economy of it's a whole different model than what we've been seeing in traditional businesses and corporations so i'm really interested to see because in the gene keys there there's a prophecy hidden within it or not hidden it's 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 out there of the next evolution of of the human species and the human being so where do you see our relationship to money shifting uh in this new iteration of what the human is turning into based on these prophecies that are coming through? Well, I think in the long term, you know, money is history. <laughs> you know, M money will not be here. Um, uh, be that's in the long term, you know, and, and, and in order for that to occur, um, probably a, a crisis is needed that shakes us to the roots of our being so that we let it go. And and then there'll still need to be lots of healing because it's caused a huge amount of trauma in the psyche of humanity for so many thousands of years. So there's there then will need to be a long period of healing of our hearts and our relationships so that we find new ways to collaborate together, like you said, with deep creativity. You know, and I do see that in the far future, or maybe the, let's call it the mid mid future. You know, um, because you never know with these things. You know, um, that we eventually what we're destined to become is is creators, gardeners, stewards of this planet, um, and artists and musicians, and and really develop that right side of our brain. And of course, that also means. Um, left side of the brain as well will bring some science with us but in a way the correct ordering is science is the is the left brain serving the right brain <laughs> rather than the other way around if the left brain's given <coughs> full charge as it is today then you know the the right brain is just which is the female the feminine yeah is 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 left out of the garden you know, the, in fact, the garden just it, the garden just dissolves because the, it hasn't been watered in a while. It, exactly, <laughs> too busy in the machinery and the detail of the machinery. And and even though it's there, there's a there, there's magic and wonder in the science and the technology that we are discovering. Um, the only real purpose of it is to serve beauty. <laughs> you know, that's so when we understand that. Um, we probably won't need as much of it um, that we have now. And probably um, there'll be less of us as well. So, you know, because we've proliferated and one of the the kind of an, another, I guess, prophecy of the Gene Keys, but it's not even so much of a prophecy as a, as a fact of what happens in systems when they over proliferate is they then go through a break down break through and then find a balance again and um and that balances with you know with human animal plant mineral in harmony 
together with nature. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't just say that like a kind of, oh, that's a nice prophecy. <laughs> um, it, it's like a, but it's good to have in our hearts to sort of have this knowing that there's a reason for the phase that we're currently in and that we have to move through this breakthrough, this threshold, this breakdown of the old systems so that something completely new can be reborn. And that's what gives us a sense of um, purpose, I think. And it's like I was saying, like for me, like even though in maybe I don't know how many decades or hundreds of years there'll be a new model um, that is emerging around us. That doesn't mean we just let go of what's you know here today. We can use and transform what we've got here today to the best of our ability, and that's you know that's what we should be doing in a way. I think it's like use what we have, but transmute it, bring life and love into it, and you know see how far you can stretch it you know, the, the current paradigm, um, even as it's mm. collapsing. <laughs> that's, that's how I view it anyway. The gene key that's coming to mind right now is gene key number three, um, which is also my radiance. And it's really interesting because I was reviewing it today and I didn't know we were going to connect these points because what you're talking about is that difficulty at the beginning um, with the shadow being chaos. And when we talk about new models, new systems, all of that, we have to go back to the origin, which is our cells. And what's really happening right now is a new paradigm of science, a new paradigm of, you know, the nucleus is not the brain of the cell, but the membrane. If you want to break down what discoveries are being made um, in quantum biology and in DNA that is completely changing the way we see the world and as well giving rise to this chaos that might that might occur that you're sort of hinting at to be able to create the new yeah it's like the intelligence that we we're discovering in the biome in the microbiome and in the you know and reflected in the macrobiome that you know we are an in, we are an interconnected intelligence and we have an interconnected intelligence inside us that um is is so collaborative <laughs> at levels that we have we, we're only beginning to grasp and so we are in our nature incredibly collaborative and codependent uh, interdependent can be codependent interdependent is a better word um and that understanding also is part of the the great revelation in this pearl sequence that we are interdependent and that's why when you make the decision to serve the whole, then you actually embrace that interdependence and you start creating coherence all around you. So wherever you put that energy of giving, and it, it can't just, you've got to give from a full heart. So if you try and give from a parched heart, from a heart that is starving, you will exhaust yourself. Yeah, so you've you've got to do your own healing first, so that you so you or at the same time, so that you feel you take care of yourself at the same time as you serve others. And if you don't do that in in equal measure, you can't feel that giving. You can't create that toroidal force, that syntropy that then generates the fortune, the good fortune. Because if you're if you don't have if you haven't done that healing in yourself, if you haven't really opened your heart fully, you know, truly, if it's if if your if your giving is not from an overflowing place, then it can't trigger the overflow of the universe, if you know what I mean. So we have to. It comes back to us, as you said. It comes back to the cell. It comes back to like taking care of ourselves first taking care of our hearts, forgiving ourselves, being gentle with ourselves, letting go of our anxiety, doing that, you know, coming into this breath, coming to the silence, coming into the pause. And then out of that still place, that's where the abundance and the 
the flourishing comes from. Yeah. And why do we learn so much when we watch a child play? I, a child is, is what we are. <laughs> and, you know, the child is spontaneous, is free, um, is filled with that interconnectivity. They are collaborative. You know, they, they, they also, they're not afraid of taking in their environment and mutating their environment and being mutated by it. And because they haven't yet learned, they haven't yet remembered even, you could say, the, the wound patterns or the trauma that actually lies inside them. <laughs> um, because we do all have that residue. And then as we mature, it starts to come online. And then in it, out of it comes our program, you know, our program of, of our life path and our healing. You know, and so there's a beauty in that. But yeah, the child reminds us of where we're going. You know, they're there at the beginning. And then they're at the end. <laughs> and that innocence, that purity of heart, that's what the child is a symbol of. The eternal child is a symbol of our heart, of love, of trust, of all these beautiful qualities. That you, in, if you look at the gene keys, you see these qualities in the cities, like you mentioned, innocence, the third gene key, the innocent city. And um, we all have, that's where we ha we start there and we come back there. But the journey makes it richer so that when we come back to where we started, it's not quite the same place. It's, it's enriched because we've gone through this journey. You know, we've begun ignorant and then we end, you know, wise. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like an innocence with wisdom. That's yeah. a powerful combination. Yeah, totally. Oh. And you see that in... In the, you know, you see it in, in the awakened beings often, you know, that. Their uh, laugh. Yeah. Buddha's belly laugh. Yeah. <laughs> mm. You have a skill in particular that I think has been largely lost in our modern era, which is knowing how to make fire with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm bringing this up because... I feel like that in itself, when you learn to do that in your 20s, it was an initiation of self-empowerment that now you know how to make fire. And I think that is something that is being lost a lot in our younger generations, the rites of passage, the initiations. You were, you were I think it was six months or a year with a shaman, working with a shaman uh, in your 20s. And, you know, what was what was that experience like and what did you learn about initiation in specific um and how can we encourage that more in our modern culture yeah i mean i think like i that was part of my path that appeared naturally for me um it's not something you can easily create but i think that you know if and when you give yourself to the spiritual journey then the that path opens up before you and different mentors and teachers come in lots of different guises. You know, it might be your piano teacher. You know, it might be, um, you know, it could be anyone. It might be your one of your family, your, you know, your grandfather or your grandmother or something. Or it, people come and they bring elements, essences of wisdom. And you and you and you know it when you see them because you because you can feel it in them and you know that there's something in them that you would like. Or well, there's something about them that you're drawn to, and you want to taste that. You like and just so, look at all my podcast guests, and then you'll find out where I'm looking for it. <laughs> right, exactly. And so, yeah, I think that that's you know that's part of the journey is is finding you know mentors who can help us kind of you know in the next step of our journey. And I definitely had that. Um. I don't think you have to look too hard because I think they there's an old saying, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears and um, and they do. And sometimes the teacher is something very simple. Sometimes it can be an animal. Sometimes it can be nature. Sometimes it can be something less than less obvious. Um, and it's probably in front of you right now. 
you're, the ultimate teacher is our suffering, actually, is the place where we are wounded the most, the place that where it hurts the most, the thing that we, that, you know, it, it might be our blame. It might be, you know, many things that we have to look at inside ourselves that are uncomfortable. That we don't, it might be anxiety, it might be depression, it might be illness. Those are all teachers. And um, that's not to say that we shouldn't also look for outside support. Often that's a really powerful thing to do is to admit that you need help and then go and find it. But the first thing is like, I need help. Like if you can say that to yourself, it's a very powerful moment. I need help with this. This feels too much for me. You know, if you can say that, it's a really powerful step in any healing journey because then you you've let the universe know you care you've you've uh, you've taken ownership and that you're willing to be vulnerable and let yourself be helped and and out of that you'll find someone so i think that's what happened for me and yeah as you say i worked with a shaman and various other teachers and who kind of helped me in different ways um a good shaman will sort of strip you down that's what their job is. A master, you know, master and a shaman, they're slightly different things. You know, I had both, but the shaman will strip you down uh, because because they are they're more connected to a tradition of um, <laughs> you know of fast learning in in terms of the physical body, especially you know, so physical training or pushing your body to limits so that you kind of surpass what you thought you were capable of and it pushes you into and stretches you in different ways. Um, in, in what way, uh, the physical training? What was that like? Uh, well, whether it was, uh, it, you know, f it was like, um, there's lots of things, but um, going into extreme cold water, you know, for long periods of time, like this, the waterfalls in Scotland, for example, in the middle of winter, in the night, that kind of stuff, jumping into like, dark freezing pools um in the dark you know um up in the wild mountains and those kind of initiations that are um you know shake you to the bedrock of your being and just being out in the wilderness is a very powerful um process to be you know if you know from colombia probably like you go out into the wilderness you spend months there it starts to kind of take you apart <laughs> and if you're with a really good teacher they they can speed up that process um i do have this one memory having been up in the highlands of scotland being taken through my you know we do sweat lodges and we do all kind you know we do everything you know like all kinds of things like i haven't got time to go into them one day i thought i might just write them in a book one day but i remember coming back into the city edinburgh after being out in the wilderness for probably six months doing this this training and i came back into the city and it was so it was such a strange feeling i felt like um a superman i felt i was walking down the this pavement and i just felt like a god i felt like wow my my whole being is completely different my my energy field was so powerful my i i felt like a I get, it's hard to explain. I get, it's kind of like a, a Neolithic hunter might have felt moving through a city. And it was obviously quite alien moving through a city because I was like, well, you know, but I, I had this strength in my bones and in my body and in my being, you know, and like creating fire was just one thing of many that I learned. But because you, 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 you go through initiations of the elements, you know, the water, the yeah. fire, the cold, um, like Hot. the avatar yeah hey <laughs> the last airbender yeah exactly <laughs> i just finished watching the live action of avatar and right i love that yeah totally anyway yeah what did the ice water teach you well nowadays that's a very common thing now isn't it because everyone's at it which is great um because of wim hof and the movement and um hmm. it um it you know, it really it strengthens you in a in a profound way because it it pushes the chi of your body deep into your core. And I mean, like anything, you can overdo it. I, I have to say that, like it's like you can easily overdo anything. And and our tendency 
it, well, it depends on your character, but some people, it could be your character to overdo things, right? And so moderation is a really powerful teacher as well. Um, and that's what a master teaches. You know, the shaman pushes you past the edge. The master teaches moderation. The master is, is, a, is, is, a, is at another level. And moderation is about finding balance, equilibrium um, inside our being so that we can go to the next level of um, consciousness. And um, so it's a really important phase in our development. But I think, you know, the ice water and, you know, can teach us many things. And, you know, it, it's very good for our health, for one thing. <laughs> it just on a purely um, physical level, it strengthens our heart. Um, and you don't want to stay in for too long, though. You know, again, you can mm -hmm. overdo it. Like four minutes, three, four minutes is enough. Um, but, yeah, for me, it was... It was more about fear in that. It was about jump because we had to jump off like what the top of waterfalls. Well, we, we didn't have to, but we chose to. Oh. In in the in the black Scottish night, you know, far the far abyss. far from anything. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. It's the first time I hear um, the experience of the ice uh, described in a more energetic way, where all your chi goes to your core. And you literally feel because the internal organs need to be safeguarded um, primarily. It's the most important thing. So I know you are also an energy worker and you train with Mantak Chia and, and other masters. How do you navigate utilizing your chi in your daily life um, to be able to be doing all this creative work, running a business? Um, do you have any practices that you do energetically to um, manage the chi in your body, the life force? I think I, I mean, I, I, I don't do formal qigong anymore. I used to. Um, everything for me has sort of become qigong. So, um, you know, I, I'm quite, I, I manage my chi through this path of moderation you know like if i if i'm sitting for too long i immediately my, i start to feel it like and and i just make sure that i balance it with some movement or or, or going for a walk you know luckily i have a kind of household that requires i'm doing lots of different things because i have a lot of animals and dogs and <laughs> cats that need attention and walking and and then i have children nearby and coming and going and and a wife and so i have a lot going on um even apart from my business so it, so it's, i have a dynamic life uh, that kind of balances itself um but i have to do the moderating and it's the same with all of us we we sort of you can work too much you can rest too much you can you know you have to find that middle way um you can meditate too much um it's 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 the the part you know the path of the sage the which is the original I Ching is the is the path of moderation to walk between the opposites and maintain the balance. Rituals then become quite important, like that morning ritual we started with, and blessings and things, and preparing food and um, you know ordinary things are really powerful. You know, so I live quite an ordinary life really. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's not very glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> but you live through it like a mystic, which is, you know, finding the magic in the ordinary yeah. in and of itself is, is a paradox because you might say, like, how can, you know, a magical life is supposed to be like me traveling around the world and meeting all these people. But yeah. you can also find magic in sitting down, having a conversation, drinking tea or cacao or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, mm. friendships. In my little book on contemplation, you know, I talk about these things like friendships and laughter. And, you know, these are like the pillars of the contemplative approach, like friend being, a, you know, nurturing your friendships. You know, if you have a life that doesn't allow you to do that, you're kind of, um, or, or, or you set up your life in such a way so that, you know, or you, or you haven't, I don't know, like that's, you, depends where you live, depends, it depends, 
on each person, like how their life is set up. But even if you have one friend, it's like a, it's a you know, one good friend. That's a, that is a, that is a soul friend. You know, the Celts call that the Anamkara, the soul friend. And, and the, and our soul so needs to have that kind of warmth of connection, of looking in someone's eyes, of laughing with them, of having a deep conversation, of sharing something vulnerable. You know, those are like beautiful, beautiful aspects of being a human. And so funny that we we starve ourselves of them. <laughs> so it's in a way, it's almost become a modern discipline for us now to nourish our friendships and our relationships um, and give special time. And, and things like... Um, I, I share this quite often. I say, you know, like our, our relationship to light, physical light, um, is really important. And in the modern world, we're, because we have screens and, you know, we, we're missing our relationship to light, a lot of modern humans. And so that's why I was saying, like, you get up in the dark, you have a candle, and then you watch the light come, like, there's nothing more precious than that. All our indigenous people, it's what they do. It's what they it's how they live. They always have. It's like they they wake up before they don't wake up after light. You know, they wake up with or before, usually before the dawn, and then they sit quietly or they tell stories or they light a fire or they're cooking something or they're hunting. And they're and they're moving with nature and the sound and the light and the frequency of the planet. And then there are there are time like the other time is dusk. It's a very magical time. It's a time where we're very busy often, you know, and actually it's another very magical time watching the nightfall and giving some time to watching nightfall and seeing the change in the light and letting our our, our kind of brain take in that light and also starlight and moonlight and sunlight. These are like, we need to give time. For them, so it's, you know, when you hold your, when you look at the sun, even not directly with your eye, but you look at it and you just allow it to come in here, and you just take a pause, even in your day, for five minutes, and you just allow the sun to just go on your face. It's so good for your chi field. You know, it's like it, your whole body starts to feel that warmth, and you start to kind of harmonize again. So the different lights, whether it's sunlight, moonlight, starlight, candlelight. You know, all these these natural spectral light fields are really important for us. They're important for our health and our well-being, and they lessen anxiety and stuff. So if we're, like, always on the screens, um, I mean, I sound like, you know, I'm a, I'm, I like, this is me, like, being a dad. <laughs> it's like, get off your screen. Um, Daddy run. <laughs> and I love screens as well, but it's like they become very addictive. We all know this. Um, but I just wanted to mm. say to people like those th those different layers of light, the effect they have on our mystical body is powerful. So starlight, being out under the stars or dawn light is like the mystic in us. Candlelight, it brings out the mystic in us. Um, yeah, you got to get out in the light. You know, we, we grew up in a world um, that separated a lot of things into boxes, um, whether that be different fields of science, of, of knowledge, and, and mostly, you know, living in that Newtonian world of reductionism. And I think what the world is missing the most right now is great synthesizers like yourself and you know, based on one of your your teachers as well, Ra um, from from Human Design, um, he told you you will codify all the spiritual ways. And you know, right now we have a world torn in many parts of the world, torn by belief systems, religions, and you know, this is the right story, this is the true origin story. Um, from studying all this material, you know, throughout your whole life, where where do you synthesize the sort of uni universal truth behind um, many belief systems, many spiritual belief systems around the world? Do you do you think there's a golden thread, a common thread between them? Yeah, I think now we 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 sort of 
there are many people who have found that thread. You know, it started, you know, a few hundred years ago with um, great mythologists who who started to see the threads and things. Like I'm thinking, like there's a there's a great book called The Golden Bough by Fraser, where he started to find the mythic threads, and Joseph Campbell started to like you know see these threads in the mythologies of the different worlds of the different cultures. And um, I think anyone that does a deep study of religion um, will see, you know, comparative religion or theosophy, um, th- um, theology, will see different threads appearing and reappearing through the religions. When I had that th- big spiritual experience um, in my 20s, I, I, I really saw all those. I saw how all those things had kind of, had like emerged in a fractal form from this one light, this one truth, and um, and how they were how they were developing in different directions through different cultures. And um, I mean, it's it's a strange thing in this day and age to synthesize them because you can't just sort of put them together. And, and every now and again, I meet someone who sort of challenges me and says, well, why are you using Hindu terms uh, or Buddhist terms? Um, you're taking them out of context of their lineage. And, and I, you know, I, I often say to people, look, you know, in my language, English, which is an incredibly diverse, wide language, there aren't all the words. They just, you know, that I have a spiritual insight, but there's no term for like dharma there's no term in english so i i've take i've i've borrowed this term that has so many dimensions because it's so rich and it has all the dimensional fields inside it and it you know it's it's a beautiful term and it can be it can represent so many different layers and so would a, vocation come close sorry Something like vocation would that come no, close, not or at is all. it completely not even different? Remotely, you know, because because mm. you know a word like dharma has so many layers of meaning in it. You know, it means so many things. It means law, and it means the sacred teachings, and it means the destiny and the journey and the goal. And it it you know it's like the word Tao. It just has so many layers, and there aren't that. I mean, God is a word, you know, but it's like, but it has charge. <laughs> um, so yeah, I it's a dilemma sometimes for me to um to use terms and I'm very, I I try and be really careful and always honor the source of where I got them from um so that because I think that's a really important thing is like honoring one's sources and um the lineages that where those words have have appeared from, you know. So but it's yeah, synthesizing is a is a it's a time of synthesis it's a time for us to begin to see where where all things stem from a single place and dis- different disciplines you know from the left brain the right brain brain from music to architecture and the arts and and science those where those things intersect um and i think we're kind of coming to the end of the age of the specialist and moving more perhaps into the age of the polymath that you know people that have studied many things and absorbed and it's not even a study but have just have a knack for understanding many things that are interconnected because you understand them through wisdom while rather than having to learn them as knowledge so the greatest most gifted um people are often not the people that have gone to school, uh, but people that have natural wisdom or had a big experience or, or their heart was deeply open and that enabled them to open their mind, their wisdom mind, and then um, understand multiple different disciplines, um, but not through a studied way, you know, There's, which isn't to say that studying doesn't get you there as well. But often um, there's that distinction between knowledge and wisdom. I try and make that distinction a lot with the Gene Keys because the Gene Keys is a wisdom system, not a knowledge system. Yeah. I think with the genetic mutations that we're going through as a species, we're going to start seeing more and more children come in with this 
insane amount of of wisdom that if we're not careful we might just be able to write them out and say you know they have nothing to say but i think those are going to be the greatest teachers for the coming years um i hope so <laughs> yeah <laughs> i hope so too <laughs> Richard, uh, one of the last questions before we get into the final segment, um, I would love to ask you if humanity were all to come together under a single ideal, what would it be? Yeah, put me on the spot. (laughs) Um, I, you know, there's so many things you could say there. I mean... I, I, I think I'm going to say the word play. You know, I, I think I'm going to bring it back to what you said earlier. Like, if we could come back to the child inside us, you know, we, that that's the highest form of a human consciousness, as far as I'm concerned. And it has many layers to it, play. Um, but I think it donates yeah the highest the highest state of consciousness when you've when you've 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 attained all else you know you've opened your heart you've expanded to take in the wisdom of the universe that's what you become you become a playful being a child again eternal child i love that and you know, we we end off every show with the final trio, which are I used to say rapid fire questions, but honestly, you can answer in any way that you want. Um, before that, let's tell people where they can connect with you further and a little bit more about some instructions to get into the the Pearl Retreat that that I'm going to be a part of as well. And I'm really excited about. So where would you send people to to go to that yeah i would just go, go to come to genekeys.com website and just you'll see it there right on the home page and um yeah it's a, it's one of our online retreats that we uh we have running throughout the year um and they're powerful because you move through a sequence together this one's about prosperity using your gene keys in a in a in a sequence over weeks and months and um, it doesn't require a huge amount of you. It's a contemplative journey. So you take it into your life at the level you can. Um, but it also is, it has many doorways. So there are ways of connecting with others on the journey, which is very rich around the world. We're always a global group, you know, usually at least a thousand people moving through it at the same time. And um, and that's powerful. And we do sort of so you do this you know we have little meditations we have q a sessions we have journeys we have webinars we but they're in a strong rhythm you know that you know you can't kind of lose your rhythm because everyone's rhythm is unique but um and also the our programs are kind of coded through the gene keys so your program is unique to you it's embedded with your keys with your gene keys um, it's really clever. It's good tech. It's great tech. Um, so yeah, I really recommend it. I love going on the journey, and this one is for me exciting because I have a lot of new insights um, to share mm. around the subject of prosperity. Some of which I've opened up here a little bit. Um, yeah, and uh, and the other thing we mentioned was the Triple Flame, uh, which is a lovely little app on the App Store, um, which is a, w- a lovely way of kind of just connecting into the Gene Keys and meditations and uh, you know it's, it's it's really nice and we will link everything in the description including the link for the retreat the triple flame which you recommended uh the three breath uh meditation which i'm going to try out tonight yeah three so harmonies i i told you i did i did um the soft the soft heart open mind meditation last night and it brought me to tears That's so beautiful. It, <laughs> really beautiful yeah and the the three harmonies is under the tab called journeys so if you click on journeys there's a whole load of meditation journeys that open up with music and you know we've created a lot over the years creative being you are a creative being i have an amazing team Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
for the final trio, um, these are questions personalized to you. And the last one we ask at the end of every show. Um, the first one is, what is something that you've experienced in the last 12 months that you wish all people experienced? I'm going to say working in a, as part of a team that it with a sense of deep trust and coherence, you know, because when you put the effort into working in a team and you, and you move through layers of dissonance and you transform them, you create a level of trust that is so sweet and beautiful and intimate regardless what your team does it could be your family it could be you know something in a community it could be a business it could be many things and any organization group um it you know when to be part of a seamless whole like that is feels like a taste of the future human to me yeah, so I, I wish that for others because um, I think it does give us a taste of what's to come. Yeah, I can relate to that because I grew up playing basketball. Right. And, you know, my, my teammates, we would go to war together and we were warriors and it was like a brotherhood that you would feel. However, that sense of teammateship, that's a long, I don't know if that's a word, but... <laughs> um, is something that I've been lacking um, with this project, with the podcast. Yeah. And I'm really calling out to to bring together that team. Um, just putting it out there, planting the seeds. Uh, I'm sure you'll get it. Beautiful. And the second question is, what does your heart say when you tune into your fondness and love for humanity's greatest shadows and gifts? You know, I think I, it, I, I don't, I can't even claim that I said this, but I did. It did, it did get written through me, but it came out as awakening as a series of softenings. And, you know, for me, that's like a central truth of my life is that it's it's not a, a difficult, hard, strenuous thing, that the greatest things, come through softening into them and through be gent being gentle and patient. And these are the pillars that I built around my teachings, like gentleness, patience, contemplation, inquiry, you know, and that approach is what opens up the heart and opens up wisdom, true wisdom, which lies in the heart or through the heart. And so I think that's really it. I sum it up like that. Thank you for being a living example of those of those teachings of those qualities. My pleasure. The Emilio. last, it's lovely to hang out with you. Of course, just just to, just to end it off, we did the time capsule question last time. I don't know if you remember, um, but essentially, you we have to travel out a little bit into the future, fifteen to twenty years. Um, this is a pretty fun question, but. When you go out to, to 15, 20 years, that is when the next generation of leaders are going to be stepping more into leadership positions around the world. And we're going to start seeing more of the new iteration of this of this new human. Um, and you're able to leave behind a time capsule for these leaders that they're going to open in 20 years. And in that time capsule, you are going to put in whatever transmission transmission, teaching, physical object, frequency, whatever you can think of to help these leaders and guide them to usher in the new earth. Last time on the show, you included the book of contemplation in there, um, the art of contemplation, which I have, I have right here. Beautiful book, literally. Ah, oh, such a good read. But what else would you include in the time capsule? Such a good question, isn't it? I like. 
you know what I was saying about play? Um, I kind of feel like I'd like to put in there an object that represents that. So I might put in there like a musical instrument or something, mm. like a wooden flute or something that's just, that has a layers of symbolism to it. Yeah, I'm going to put a wooden flute in there, maybe one that I made myself. Um, and just because I love tinkering with wood and um, yeah, a little wooden flute, because I think that that would um, remind people of the metaphor of like we are wooden flutes and yet we're here just to, we're here to sound beautiful music and we're a hollow vessel, really. And oh. yeah, something like that, something that's musical. I think music is. It's, you know, probably our highest potential creation on this earth. And it must be a whole different process of creating something with your hands than creating something through like a teaching that goes on a book. Mm -hmm. it, it must be a completely different process. So, yes, beautiful. <laughs> we'll have the book in there, the gene keys, the flute. It'll be a, a dope. Uh, <laughs> Uh, time capsule brother thank you so much for your infinite well you are a well of wisdom and such a gentle heart and open spirit and it's just been an honor uh getting to know you yeah. and, and continuing thanks me it was an honor for me too you are you're a very beautiful man and i love um the depth of your wisdom and the truth that you carry yeah appreciate that my heart felt that yeah. <laughs> till next time yes